I would love to love welcome you. all of you to today's Gems from the Wisdom Traditions, a conversation circle in which we do our best to extract the essence even as the bee gathers honey from all the different wisdom traditions of the world. And I am so pleased to have with us today someone who has been very dear to um, the hearts of myself and my husband, Cliff Tillotson. We actually had a chance to live for a time as housemates um, when he was raising his family of two daughters and had the privilege of sitting at their dinner table and having some wonderful conversations. Uh, we also had the chance to take um, uh, attend lectures of his when we were at Sandra, where he was a professor at the time. And we are um, now separated by distance, but um, not in the heart. He's um, in upstate New York right now. He uh, is someone who is a longtime student of theosophy. In fact, last year, I believe it was that at the International Theosophical Conference, he was the keynote speaker. So he's really recognized for the depth of his understanding of, of theosophy. So that's the tradition from which we will be hearing about today's topic, which is between heaven and earth, the bridge between heaven and earth. So can I hand it over to you, Elton? Hey, it's good to see you today. It's good to see you, Cliff. I haven't seen either of you for what, 30 years now. Yes. <laughs> and you haven't changed a bit. There you go. <laughs> well, I will talk from a theosophical uh, perspective tonight, but I'm not going to use a lot of theosophical terms um, that may not be familiar to people. Uh, I'm going to try to put it very straightforwardly in pretty straightforward language. Throughout the history of the world, there has been a philosophical position called monism. That can mean lots of different things to different people, but what it means is all existence through all time has had a single ultimate source. That idea pervades much of our thinking. In science, the Big Bang is the source. Uh, the search for the theory of everything implies there is some common ground that could be captured in an equation or set of equations. In some religions, God is that ultimate source. Uh, whether thought of as a being or the underlying ground of existence, um, in theosophy, it's often just called that, the demonstrative pronoun that points, but doesn't tend, that doesn't try to characterize in any way. The interesting thing about monism that I have noticed a lot of people haven't thought a great deal about is that it has a radical implication, and that is everything partakes of that source. Everything is the source of differentiated, something like a reflection. So there's an old axiom that's used in philosophy that comes in lots of traditions, as above, so below. Somehow, we contain and exhibit that source. Everything does. This gives clues to the idea of a bridge between heaven and earth. Let's take an analogy. It's an old Buddhist one. Imagine a full moon on a clear night, and you're standing by a large pond or a lake. Um, you see the moon reflected in the lake. If the lake is still, the moon's reflection is very clear. You can instantly identify it as the moon. If, however, 
there's a little breeze or something and the lake is a little ruffled, the moon's light is scattered. It's interesting. The scattering is still just the moon's reflection, but it certainly doesn't look like the moon. Curiously, it often looks like a path across the pond or lake to the moon. Well, for thinking beings, that is, human beings, we're able to reflect on what we are and reflect on what our existence is. But we, too, can be like that lake, serene or ruffled. And that affects the reflection in our own minds as to what we see and experience. But that source of existence is in us in some way. Um, well, we may not be able to discern it. If all you could ever see was the ruffled reflection, the reflection of the moon on the ruffled lake, you'd probably never figure out it was a reflection of a moon, a round orb in the sky. We can do so only because we can compare the two. Um, so if we're ruffled ourselves, so to speak, the very source of our existence is probably not discernible by us. To get a more concretely human look, philosophy teaches that the mind is dual. There is a, what we might call lower mind, which tends to be discursive, practically oriented, focused as a subject on objects often out there or with things like aches and pains and so on in here but in the body not in the mind itself and it's affected by desires by needs by wants by cultural conditioning by the very vocabulary we've developed in the languages we use the source of existence is quite out of reach for such a mind. It's like looking at the scattered fragments of light glittering across a ruffled, uh, wind-driven pond. But it still encompasses and is beyond all categories of discursive thought, whatever that source is. So we can't think it. Anything we say about it, the theologian Paul Tillich, Christian, major Christian theologian in the 20th century, uh, put it this way, to say anything about the ground of being, which is what he called God, is to make it finite when it is, from our perception, infinite. But the mind is dual. It has a higher dimension which tends to look at the universal and is intuitive in the classical sense. You may recall Plato did in a big dialogue called the Republic, uh, set out something called the divided line, divided into four sections. Without going into detail, those sections starting, so to speak, at the bottom were opinion and true opinion. And then knowledge, including things like mathematical knowledge. And then universal neurosis, universal intuition, direct experience of the universal. So the mind is dual, but it's not split. And we see this in our ordinary thinking. Science likes to say it's experimental and deals with practical things. There are many people who say they like to be practical. That's fine. But notice, you can't have a theory without doing something abstract. In fact, most of us have to use popularizers of modern physics to understand anything about it because modern physics is put in such a complex mathematical language, most of us do not grasp that at all. I certainly don't. The dual aspect of mind then is inviting us 
to engage in abstract thinking, but of the highest kind, where we have senses of insight, sometimes realization, a deep aha moment, maybe about our lives or about others or about humanity as a whole. Uh, even something that's called epiphanies, where it's almost as if something quite beyond us has suddenly entered us, shown us something, um, entered the mind. Intuitions then don't involve the ordinary rational discursive thinking that we engage in using categories and comparisons and so on. Actually, it's often beyond words. Christian theologians have called this the experience of the luminous, something transcendent. Um, and many, many people have such experiences. We probably all have them if we really look back over our lives carefully. What happened? That moment our gaze met someone and we began to fall in love. There's a reason why we call it falling in love. It's something that seems to have happened to us rather than something we did. In fact, if somebody said to you, well, I'm going to go out and make myself love somebody, you would probably be skeptical. It doesn't quite work that way. And often our deepest insights don't work that way. They seem to come upon us. So that dual mind is linked. It's got the very practical, uh, world-oriented um, part, and then that very deep, reflective part that's open to something that we really have no easy name for. Um, theosophy identifies that linkage between the two as something it calls the antaskarana, or if you want the proper Sanskrit, antakarana. Um, it's a bridge. It links the two. It's the higher entering the lower, the lower opening itself and rising up to the higher. So you could say it's like it shines its higher dimension into its lower dimension. And the lower dimension becomes receptive and porous to it. That's why we need things like reflection, meditation, stilling sometimes of our rather um, scattered mind, just to reflect on things in us we know are there that are deeper than all of that. So one could think of a higher dimension of the mind as the moon. Of course, what we see is the light coming from the moon. So we could see that as the higher dimension. The lower dimension could be like the reflection in the pond. Both are light. In fact, they're exactly the same light, but they're experienced quite differently. And how they're experienced depends on whether uh, that reflection is still clear or if it's ruffled like the surface of that lake. Philosophy also teaches that <clears throat> that's the source of the values, not all the detailed moral and social rules we follow um, uh, and cultural given meanings that we may have learned, but what we might call pure ethics, the principles that you will notice people all over the world at least aspire to and try to adhere to. The most common one that is said in every religion class I know of is the golden rule is found everywhere. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Uh, that's one example. But if we take that seriously, if we take anything that we've said here seriously, then value and meaning is a response to that higher by inviting it into our lives. And that means transforming our lives uh, from above, below. As above, so below. The below cannot just climb up to the above. The mind 
can think in terms of the above and help radiate it down into the below. How we live our lives affects our mind. We know that, for instance, if we get a backache or something like that, it affects the way we're thinking, it affects our attitudes, our moods, and everything. Um, and mind affects how we live. If we suddenly see something clearly, um, a friend of mine for a few years got into a terrible spiral of addiction. And one day, kind of coming to, he realized he was way off track and started to clear up those addictions. He sought help, of course, uh, but he cleared up those addictions. How does that happen if something deeper in us doesn't reach out to the part of us that's doing and the acting and so on? So mind affects how we live. So the question that I'm going to leave you with um, for discussion is simply this. Are we trying to be like the moon, that light that we see in the sky? Or are we trying to be just like the scattered light reflected in the ruffled lake? The choice is ours. End of sermon. <laughs> Thank you, Elton. Your question to us is whether we are seeking to live our lives as the moon reflecting clear light, or whether we're seeking to live our lives like the uh, reflection on the surface of the lake, which may be uh, a clear reflection if the lake is still. But if the lake is ruffled, it will certainly be anything but a clear reflection of that, that steady light of the moon. And then perhaps a further question on that is what do we find is helpful for each of us in terms of stilling that lake yes. so that we can be reflecting clearly? Yes. Yeah. Well, the floor is open and we have one, a lot of wonderful minds and hearts out there people with uh, great personal experience. Jim, this is Jim Tepfer. The, uh, um, the, the question I have is, uh, in terms of the, the bridging between the lower mind and the higher mind, um, does, the, does the nature of the ideas that we contemplate, that we consciously focus on, does the nature of the ideas, concepts, ideals, does it affect the relationship between the higher and the lower mind? Is that a question to me? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's making suspicion. <clears throat> I would say absolutely because, and this is where the analogy breaks down, because we have to have wind or something to ruffle the lake. But it's the mind itself which is doing the ruffling. Um, if we don't have universal enough ideas and abstract enough ideas that they begin to affect how we think even discursively and about everyday matters, uh, that bridge can't be crossed. That's the way we get the higher to shine better into the lower is because we are reaching up with those ideas. And there's really no other way to reach up except with those ideas, with the finest feelings, with the universal thoughts. Give a simple example. Um, we love our families. And we have lots of obligations uh, surrounding that love of family. But if our feelings, our best feelings, are restricted just to the family, then we've closed ourselves off and isolated ourselves from the rest of the world. But the rest of the world is humanity and 
everything in it. So, if we're actually, if as above below, we're actually in some way have everything in existence reflected in us, then that's an artificial barrier and it will limit us uh, as well as not really good for anyone else. So the first thing we think is we broaden the circle. So we include friends. Probably many of us include a community we're in uh, or an organization. Um, it's harder but important to begin thinking of the whole of humanity. Somebody in Iran or the, UK or the Ukraine who is suffering is suffering just as much as somebody in my family or somebody next door. Now, I can't rush halfway around the world to do anything about it, but I can certainly sympathize, empathize, and have compassion for and awareness of the whole of humanity, in fact. Uh, but that takes work because it's something I have to deliberately do and that bridge is not crossed without doing things quite deliberately. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go on so long, Jim. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Elton, um, on, on the symbolism of the bridge, uh, I was wondering about this Antiscarna bridge, whether you would say it's something that's pre-existing in our nature, or is it something that we individually as human beings need to construct. And, oh. if we do, and if we do need to construct it in some way, a lot of times you think about bridges, or as I've seen them being constructed, they're constructed from both sides simultaneously. So is there a, is that possible uh, analogy there that if the Antiscarda bridge needs to be constructed uh, to, to cross over a gulf, it needs to be both from the lower side and the higher side simultaneously built? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, the way to talk about this is kind of difficult. Uh, if we think, for instance, in like physics, uh, just regular physics, not quantum physics, we talk about energy, but we talk about potential and kinetic energy, meaning the energy is there, but unless the circumstances are right, it will not display itself. So I hold the book in my hand, it's there, it's got a certain kinetic energy, but if I suddenly remove my hand, the book then falls to the floor, um, thanks to gravity. In philosophy, we tend not to talk so much about potential becoming actual. We tend to talk about what is there beginning to manifest. Uh, and I actually like that language better because I think you can be more nuanced with it. Um, and if you use that kind of language, then I think Cliff, you're exactly right. The bridge is there, but it's not manifest very strongly um, until we make efforts to bring it into manifestation. So you can say we're strengthening it. As we strengthen it from our side with the way we think, with the way we reflect, with the way we act, with the way we try to scare ourselves, um, it also reaches down from the other side. There was a uh, famous neoplatonist, um, whom Klebovatsky invoked once in a while in her writings, um, who disliked the idea that pure reasoned um, conclusions could bring one to a realization of the source of things and of one's own ultimate nature. He said, you have to 
prepare yourself. Now he put it in terms of the gods. You have to prepare yourself to receive the gods, but they're the ones who come. And so interestingly enough, you get this idea of grace. If we're prepared, things will happen. And the preparation has to be on our side. But the way we prepare is by in consciousness in our minds, trying to see uh, and understand from the highest possible level, that's how we strengthen the bridge from our side. And then, so to speak, it's like help comes from the other side. So, uh, Elton, in the case of the friend of yours you were talking about who had a problem with uh, a substance addiction, yes. how, how do you think that that worked? Uh, this working from both sides of the bridge, so to speak, from, from above and from below. Could you describe that? Yes. <laughs> it would be impossible, I think, for most of us to get into the psychology or the spirituality of another person very... Um, Right, just theoretically. <laughs> theoretically, if I were first to give an account of what happened, this was like many people in his uh, position, um, was in many ways a very fine person. There was something there that always knew there was something more than what he'd come, invo come involved with, and that there was something more to him himself, he knew, I think, than what he was involved in. And at some point, something happened that allowed him to establish that connection with his deeper self enough for him to start turning around, for him to see that it was worth turning around. Um, and I think that's important. One has to really see that there is more than what one is doing if one is going to, in any way, do more. Um, so that's as close as I could come. I would not want to do a psychoanalysis or anything like that of that individual okay. or anyone else. But one of the things that you mentioned in terms of having big enough ideas, clear enough ideas, is that, for example, if we're just thinking of ourselves or just thinking of our family, it's not, and we are actually beings who uh, have within us the entire universe, then we have to like expand to community and beyond that to country and to whole, whole world. Do you feel as if maybe part of that was expanding not just mind, but kind of heart, feeling, caring, seeing that he was not able to engage with this whole larger world, perhaps that he had so much to offer and give, could he clear himself up that he could be uh, a better servant and more largely connected with the whole? Would that help open that channel to... Oh, absolutely. Well, I talked in terms of the mind, but if one is going to have really large thoughts, that can't be separated from the heart. One of the things that I was trying to indicate without getting into a deep philosophical discussion was that if we take it as a fact, that what is above the source is in some way in us, reflected in us, um, um, however you want to put it. That also means, therefore, that what to use the metaphor of the heart, what the heart does, 
how we relate to others, the whole of humanity, indeed to the whole of existence, is absolutely part of that. I don't see how you could separate the best elements of the mind from the deepest elements of the heart. Does that help at all, or did I just confuse things? Well, it seems as though when we awaken that heart, um, I know there's an ancient expression, behind will stands desire. And desire is something about the heart. We, we desire something. And, and it then might help us have that willpower to face that addiction and put ourselves into alignment clear away all that that addiction was clouding over us but clear that way and um that would allow that that light to come through and also would allow our light to go back out and unify with something greater than ourselves and so something about that desire like I want to yes. be one with the humanity. <laughs> Maybe. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, Shankaracharya in the Hindu tradition uses a different analogy than the one I use. He says the sun, meaning the spiritual source of everything, the sun is always there shining. It's the clouds that darken the earth. Clearing the clouds away, the sun, which was always there, now shines through. And the clouds can be everything from our ignorance to our misconceptions and misperceptions to our biases to our desires which are not really worthy of us. Um, so yes, I think you're quite right. One of the things that people like the Amblipkis, the Neoplatonists, talked about was you can't welcome the gods you can't expect higher powers to in some sense descend in and on you unless you purify yourself and for him purification was mental moral and physical um, to put this very abstractly Philosophy teaches, of course, the idea of karma. But karma is not just, I do something like I, I throw a pie in the nose face, and so sometime in the future, she, she throws a pie in my face. Karma is the constant attempt to reach an adjustment. It's a constant attempt to become like the unruffled lake in all existence but that means it's not just my karma and your karma it's the whole of humanity it's the whole of the universe it's way too complex for anybody to kind of try to figure out um, um, but what comes to us in a sense comes to us with reason uh, somehow we have set up the conditions which allow for that to happen. So as I change the conditions of my life, morally, mentally, physically even, I will at least be generating a different kind of karma, a smoothing out of things, call it an atoning for things, if you like. We can begin to get a sense of there's reason and purpose in everything we do, then we need to examine everything we do, including our desires. But there's another statement, comes from a little work called The Voice of the Silence, which says, compassion is the law of laws. Well, if karma is a universal law, why is compassion the law of laws? Because that even I attempt to adjust Sometimes it's called retribution, but only in the sense of giving back what was what was given out. Um, why would compassion then be the law of laws? Because karma is compassion. 
if things did not come back to us the way we gave them out, we would never learn what's really going on, what we're really doing, what we can be doing. Uh, so that attempt to, that endless process of attempting to make the lake perfectly clear and unruffled is a constant adjustment. Now, think of a breeze blows across the pond and it gets all ruffled. What is the natural tendency in the pond to return to stillness? So you could say, if our desires were in the right place, if our thinking was in the right place, the natural tendency in the human being would be to reflect that moon as clearly as a still pond can. Beautiful. Let's let's see who else might have some some questions, some comments, some way in your daily life that this makes uh, a lot of sense. Tony. Ah, thank you, Renee. Thank you, Elton. This is great. Uh, I love the analogy. Um, for me, the bridge between heaven and earth that uh, the bridge is already uh, there and it's always there. <clears throat> and the, uh, that the reflection uh, on the pond, uh, for me, that the lower mind uh, is, is in, in daily activity and past, um, past events that happened. Um, and that causes for me the ripples in the lake. And that underneath that ripple, underneath the surface layer, is the stillness in the pond. And so the connection for me is always there. And that uh, really what am I uh, constantly returning to focus on, either the stillness or the ripple? And am I willing to return back to the stillness in that connection to that bridge? And the more that I bring awareness to the stillness, that it activates that more in my daily life. Like you were saying, it, it's constantly, it's constant adjustments. So that's, that's my experience uh, with that. Thank you. Perfect. Very nicely put. Thank you. Bariba? There you go. For sure, the metaphoric images are very helpful. But uh, I am, uh, I think I was taking in that compassion is the law of law and karma is compassion. Could you collaborate on that a bit more? Is the bridge that already there? It's, um, <laughs> uh, it's really there a lot to take in, I believe. I think it would be fair to say the bridge is both there and needs to be constructed. Uh, perhaps a better analogy would be like um, the computer is there, but you have to turn it on for it to do anything. Um, in biology, there's this interest, there's this notion of homeostasis in which an organism constantly works to keep everything in balance. We most easily see this, for instance, in um, human temperature. The body constantly works to keep the body at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We walk out in a cold climate, it engages in, in energy use to heat the body up. We go into one climate, it tries to cool down by, by slowing the metabolism of certain parts. Um, but homeostasis is not static. It is, in fact, unstable. That's why there has to be constant adjustment. Karma is the homeostasis of the universe. But if everything has one single ultimate source, 
and it there's life and thinking in the universe then compassion the recognition the connection that we're all part of the whole is our realization in human terms of what karma is doing all the time, which is karma, you might say, is the effort at homeostasis in the universe. But we can't think of that just in physical terms because there's more than just physical terms in the universe. Mathematics, for instance, is not physical. Thought is not physical in that sense. Consciousness is not physical. So when we think, speak of karma being homeostasis of the universe, that common effort to even things out, um, uh, we have to think at all those levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It all. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's helpful when you mention about the connection because uh, oh. that's also the way that helps us to actualize and verbalize mm -hmm. in a tangible way who we are. Thank you. Yes. I have a question for Elton. A very easy one after all those very difficult ones. Uh, if if um, a person was uh, wanting to understand bridge building in the way that you're describing it, um, what is there a book on bridge building, or is there is there some book? It, for someone starting out and wanting to understand that you would recommend, this would be a good starting point. Well, I can't think of a book that would just be nothing but bridge building. Do you have one in mind? I would think, I would invite people if they were really interested in bridge building from the kind of perspective I'm coming from, looking at William Kwan Judge's The Ocean of Theosophy. Uh, which presents theosophy very straightforwardly. Um, it's pretty heavy going, plunging into the secret doctrine, but if one is used to, um, um, or wants to ramp up one's abstract thinking and breadth, uh, the secret doctrine will certainly do it. Uh, but for a more straightforward presentation, or there's a flock of articles of different kinds. Um, the Beacon Light of the Unknown, which Helena Blavatsky wrote, uh, is very helpful. The key to theosophy, though some of it is cast in 19th century terms in terms of theosophy and other uh, paths and so on, um, uh, is also very good if one is not put off by some of the 19th century discussions that were going on. Uh, those are all very clear. The reason why I like the key to theosophy is the nature, higher, lower mind, uh, pure intuition, um, universal consciousness, uh, desire, uh, the physical constitution, the life energies, um, are all explained there. And what's very interesting about it is they're explained four different ways. Four times, she says, look, here's a chart of how this all works in the human being. And each time it's a little different. And it seems like there's a very good reason for that. And that is when we start thinking especially if we try to think in very uh, abstract, clear, universal terms, it's very easy to end up fossilizing those terms um, as a philosophical term, reifying, turning them into a thing, 
when one is talking equally about functions, equally about energies, as well as any kind of stuff. Um, and so every time she presents it, she presents it a little differently, quite deliberately. Uh, and then says, no, no, wait a minute. I was looking at it this way. Now you can look at it that way. And surely that's very important because one of the things that we've probably all discovered as the 20th century vague and of the 21st century is black and white doesn't really work very well. Um, not even 50 shades of gray are quite enough. Um, nuance and subtlety are the name of the game of life, so to speak. And the more we can be aware of that, the more limbo, uh, uh, limber our own thinking becomes. And that, too, helps strengthen that bridge uh, with the deepest in us. And as we consider, try to look at things and think of things from that higher point of view, that actually affects our ordinary everyday consciousness over time. Um, Physiologists used to say that by the time a person is about 20 years old, the brain has been what it's going to do. Uh, and it's just there. What they've been saying since the beginning of well, the 1990s is we have discovered the brain learns and adjusts throughout life. Next week, I will be 80 years old. A uh, thought somewhere between pride and terror. Um, <laughs> And, um, well, who ever thought that was going to happen? Right? Um, and it's nice to know that I can still learn new things and new ways of doing things. I even learned how to unmute my computer. See? So um, that's very helpful. Um, well, who wrote the book, As a Man Thinketh? Goes back to the Dhammapada. You know, very opening lines. The way you think become the way you are. And what I'm really suggesting, if we could think right, in a more universal way, we'd become more universal as beings. And that would show up in our actions, our speech, as well as our thought. Um, Elton, um, when you speak about and going to this kind of different kind of compass rather than directing us how to go down the street and with the lower mind, which is important <laughs> to get the right address and all. But, um, but when we're thinking of a different kind of compass, it's kind of more like a moral compass where we're trying to discern right action before we come up, it's beyond strategy. Because if you don't have the right heart, and you don't have the right principle, then what good is your strategy? Because you're operating on the wrong assumptions. Yes. So um, could you say something about the difficulty of rising to universal thinking because we're so much on our personality, what we like, what we don't like, what we've been taught to believe, what we, and we're kind of stuck in what, you know, Buddhists would call attachments and we're coming from the emotional nature. So when we look at our president, for example, our emotional nature will come out. And so we never get beyond that emotional nature and we actually become almost the same in a different way because we haven't somehow crossed that bridge you referred to, the bridge to the higher mind. Could you say something more about the challenge of moving beyond the personality and the personal? Dalai Lama has been through quite a lot. In the 50s, he had to flee Tibet. It was, of course, we now think of there being Tibetan monasteries uh, in India and in other places in the world, France, Italy, United States. Um, I think Ithaca is very proud that the monastery built here is becoming the repository of the Dalai Lama's personal papers. Um, but he's been through a lot. 
and you could say, well, he's been very successful as a teacher and so on, but it wasn't because the way was made easy for him. And one time he said something is incredibly, to me, radical. Uh, he said, remember, your enemy is your teacher. That's a rather different perception than most of us are inclined to have. Some of us are not really pleased with our president right now. But what can I learn about elements in myself to become defensive or even a hostile given elements I see in him or anyone else in the world. This is quite different from making a judgment about a person as a whole person. Certainly possible to judge behavior, some behaviors better than others. Certainly impossible if possible to judge words. Some words are harsher, some words are peaceful. But to put it in older language, I'm in no position to judge the soul of anybody. I'm actually in no position to know much about my soul. And the reason for that is all the reasons Maurice just gave. It's being centered on the personality. Uh, it's being centered on its wants, desires, wishes, what it likes, what it dislikes and so on. As long as that is sort of the, the midpoint of the circle of one's existence, then that's what one will have. One lives, one dies. Um, as one begins to expand one's consciousness, the personal side becomes less and less significant. We still have an instrument we have to use. We're not getting rid of the lower mind. We're not getting rid of the body. We should care for both because they allow us to do and be and see and think things. <clears throat> but the more our thought expands as we draw the circle to include more and more, which is an ongoing process, um, the more those take, so to speak, a more proper place. If somehow the whole of existence is reflected in us, then we have the potential to reflect the whole of existence. And doing anything less than that is insufficient, though it may take, in philosophy, many, many lifetimes to even approach that possible um, stance. Great question, great answer. Janine, do you have a question? It's a question or a, a thought that came to mind in terms of how some of the ideas that have been um, mentioned today you've seen play out in, a, in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Well, I really um, have been appreciating, kind of still mulling over this idea of um, the bridge and that it's there, but perhaps not yet manifest, um, or we are perhaps strength going through some practices or processes, processes to strengthen our ability to become aware of, of the bridge. And it has made me think a lot about just the power of the imagination. Um, and in particular, it actually made, when you talked about this, you said something about how we we're strengthening it. It made me think about uh, this cl class that I take at Still and Moving Center that is about the spine. And there's a, it's about kind of strengthening the spine and creating more space. But there's, um, our teacher sometimes will talk about how like, well, it's just an idea. Like you're not, you're not yet doing an action. You're just, uh, it's in your imagination and you're thinking it. And perhaps the more that you think it, the more it becomes an actual sensation in your body. Um, but it's that imaginative act, that thinking that then that is the bridge or it's what builds the bridge. And it's something that I have actually over three or four months been able to feel. I, I can feel how I started just thinking something 
And, and then it has become something in my body where I, I have, through my imagination, through this thinking process, uh, really, really built a bridge that has given me kind of not just uh, more ease in my body, but I think also really helped my, my whole being. So, so I think that that's one of, one of the things I will keep thinking about after this discussion is that power of the imagination. So I thank you for that. Mary, can I ask you to uh, weigh in here for a sec? Something that uh, strikes you as ringing true? Or... One of the things that um, made me think of you during our discussion today, Mary, was this uh, conversation about grace and that in order for us to really receive it, we have to prepare ourselves that we have to do the cleansing, we have to do the um, making ready to, to receive it. It's always there available. It's just a matter of, are we ready to receive it, right? That's true, because grace is given when we do not deserve it. But we can earn it, and if we can acknowledge when we have it, I mean, each of us have graces. They're gifts from God. And what we do with those graces are our gift back to God in thanksgiving. So, yes, we, we have many graces, and, and I am guilty of not accepting and not appreciating them through, very often throughout my entire life. And I try to just accept that, you know, God forgives, God loves, you know, love is, is ev ev eternal and just try to keep getting better. Amen. <laughs> One of the things that various sages, including um, Thomas Aquinas, Dionysius, Meister Eckhart, uh, and pointed out, if we're going to in any way improve in the kinds of ways I've been talking about, we have to acknowledge what you just did, our imperfections, when we do something wrong, when we do something in haste, uh, when we're mean-minded, whatever it is, um, and the list is long for many of us. Um, but we don't catch ourselves just expressing lots in our own selves, beating ourselves up is the modern way to put it. Over those, we acknowledge them. Where we can, we correct them. Like if I have said something really offensive to another person and I realize it, I can go and apologize. Um, and there's some things we can't change. It's too late. I mean, it's happened and that's it. Um, but I acknowledge them and that helps me see how not to do them again. But I don't spend all my time sunk into feeling sorry for myself for having not been a very good person. Uh, that's not very useful. Uh, and that ability to both acknowledge, fix where one can, move on where one can't, and improve, I think is also a form of grace uh, that I see in a lot of people. Okay, Elton, can I ask, um, so before you can get from the lower self to the higher self, the conscious and the subconscious, the bridge between that, I feel like in just what you were speaking on, the awareness that we need to get with through meditation, reflection, and all of that, and healing like traumas that we have, or just awareness that we don't have for the thinking mind, our actions, how we, when things affect us emotionally, how we respond until we have that. Like, I feel like that's the ripples on the pond first. And then when we get to the stillness, 
we can get into, uh, I guess you would say the moonlight or see the reflections of the moon. And I feel like we have to work towards even con controlling the thinking between the conscious and the subconscious before even getting to the higher self. Yes, the reason why I didn't use a word like subconscious was because in theosophy there are lots of states that that word probably covers. Um, they'd have to be dealt with differently. But yes, uh, um, part of Well, there are two practices that are advocated. One is called self-study, where you just look back over the day. Um, and Plotinus originally taught this in, in the Western traditions, um, to see what you did well, what you could have done better, what you may have actually done bad, badly, what opportunities you missed, what opportunities you took up, but maybe not maybe only half-heartedly. In other words, just look at the day and see how it went in terms of one's own ideals. Uh, and then the second is meditation, where you quite deliberately try to be calm and think the highest thoughts one can, dwell on them, um, reach toward the source. Um, and if you've tried any of this you know it's just amazing the flood of distractions come in no wonder the lake is um, not fighting them just coming back to what it is you were focused on um, those began to affect yes all levels of the mind uh, and that and as those levels become better knit or to put it in the other analogy, as one makes some progress crossing that bridge, um, it would make a real difference in one's life, in one's awareness, in one's dealings with others, uh, in one's way of looking at others in the world. You know, psychologists say, a person who's pessimistic looks and only sees downsides on things. An optimistic only sees upsides. Often when a person says they're realistic, they're looking at the downsides. Um, we're not supposed to be Pollyannas or just idle dreamers, but how we see ourselves and the world and the rest of humanity profoundly affects on what we're actually going to be able to perceive, which means what we're going to be able to experience. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You know, I'm noticing the time, and I wanted to ask Cliff if he would give a vote of thanks to Elton for our excellent, excellent presentation and uh, answers to questions and conduction, conducting of an excellent discussion. Well, yeah, it's, it's a real honor, Elton, to hear you speak after so many years that I haven't been able to hear you speak. I was reflecting on the first time I heard you uh, speak at the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara in a class I took called Theory and Practice in Politics when I was um, a sophomore. And he did actually, he spoke on Plato's Republic and the, and the um, divided line and the allegory of the cave on that first time I ever heard him speak and it, it blew me away. And it's just a tremendous, tremendous joy to connect up again after over 40 years ago was that lecture that you gave. And I've heard many, many, many other wonderful lectures by Elton Hall. But today I think he offered all of us an opportunity as a guide, a navigator using Reese's idea of a compass to explore inner realms that we don't, I mean, we probably explore individually, but in this kind of a context where we can all kind of come together and explore our inner selves, our inner minds and hearts together is a, is a very therapeutic and very refreshing um, experience. And I, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us, Elton, for being that kind of uh, guide and, and with the clarity in which you presented everything. Thank you so much for listening. It was so nice to see most of you whom I've never met before.
and I'm glad you spoke up. I have to tell the name Cliff <coughs> that my wife Kathy sent her greetings and love, and our daughter Anita, who we now live with, um, says that she thinks I should come over there to give a series of talks and that the entire family should be brought over as support. <laughs> we definitely agree. That's a grand idea. <laughs> it's really a delight to have all of you from all of your different life paths and perspectives. Um, I wish we had time for everybody to, uh, to share. I know every single one of you would have something really valuable. Thank you ever so much, one and all. And thank you so much, Elton. Thank you. Thank you.